Welcome back to the Student Hub Live STEM Showcase. In this session, we take a look at what the School of Physical Sciences have to offer in terms of curriculum. We've got a packed session, so I'm delighted to introduce you to Andrew Norton and Meredith Morrell. Now, Andrew has been involved with the OU Physical Science curriculum for 26 years, I tell you. Um, so he should know a thing or two. Um, he's worked on 19 different modules, um, chairing over half of them. And he's also um, uh, been the curriculum director for physical sciences for eight years. And I think this will impress you all at home, has been uh, responsible for establishing astronomy and planetary science as a defined area of the curriculum. <laughs> so thank you for joining us, Andrew. Quite right, thank you. Now you'll see that we've got some different things for you to vote with here. We'd like to know which area of the physical sciences you're interested in. And we've also got some continuum. So choose where along that line you feel you are. Do you want to study a course that includes practical science? Did you realize that you could control robotic experiments remotely? Um, and what is your main motivation for studying physical science if indeed that's what you want to do. You can also engage in the chat and there's lots of conversation to be had there also. Right, Andrew, let's start before we go on to all the exciting stuff with the curriculum. Mm -hmm. So what qualifications are available in physical science? I see we've got a nice Yeah, students can see here. this on the website. So most students, I think, will be following one of two areas. They'll be looking at our natural sciences degree. Within that, they can follow a physics pathway mm -hmm. or an astronomy and planetary science pathway, or they might be doing our mathematics and physics degree, which does what it says by the name. Of course, many students will do an open degree and just pick and choose some physics or astronomy modules or our open uh, STEM degree, combined STEM degree, which again, lets people mix and match. Brilliant. And Linda was telling us earlier that there were some certificates and diplomas mm. that students could do if they didn't want to commit to a full degree. Exactly. So essentially stage one of the degree, you can exit at that point with a certificate in, in natural sciences. After stage two, you can exit with a diploma in natural sciences or go all the way to stage three and exit exit with a degree. And what's this MSc space science? Yeah, that's something we launched just last year. I was involved with, with producing that. So it, it is again what it says. We have a Master of Science in Space Science, which uses uh, a lot of our open STEM lab kit, uh, telescopes, which we'll talk about later, other um, things like we have our own Mars yard here on campus with Mars rover. Students control this Mars rover, driving it around the Mars landscape wow. as if it were really on Mars, and that, that's in the MSc, yeah. Brilliant. <laughs> so where do students start then? What's the sort of first level okay, that they might well, meet? Okay, well, many people may have already done S111, Questions in Science, which is our introductory science module. The physical science content of that is based around questions like, is there life on Mars? Are waves everywhere? And um, how does the sun shine? So there's a bit of physics, a bit of astronomy, a bit of planetary science in there. After that, if you're following one of our physics or astronomy and planetary science pathways, most people will do a maths module next, MST124, Essential Mathematics Part 1. And again, the name says it all. It's the essential mathematics you need to go on to study at Stage 2. But the, the, the final module which we've got at, at Stage 1, which I've just been chairing the production of, is a new module called SM123, Physics and Space. And I'm really pleased with this module. We've been running it since February. The next presentation will start in October, so people can sign up now. And that's got things about the physics of very small scale, atoms, nuclei, particles, physics of the everyday scale, forces and energy, and the physics of very large scales, astronomy, planetary science, cosmology, and it's a really fantastic module, I think. Brilliant. <laughs> well, everyone was sharing their feelings about previous modules mm. that they've studied, and we've got Darren on our hot desk. Welcome, Darren. How's everyone at home? Morning. Fine, thank you. Um, there's no questions coming yet um, further, but everybody is quite interested in um, physics and astronomy by the look of it. <laughs> yes, it has <laughs> been a very popular, yes. popular yes. area, as it, as it often is. Mm. Tell us a bit about the, the maths, mm. uh, MST124, yes. because a lot of students um, I meet certainly say, I really love all the mm. STEM except for the mm. maths bit, not mm. so keen on all of that. But the way that we teach mathematics um, in these modules isn't the way that people might suspect we do. Oh no, it's, um, we know the problems students have, some students, so it, it's, it's very well constructed, it leads students through from the very basics through to using maths as a tool for the physics in mm. our case that mm. we need people to use it. And maths is the language of physics. You know, you, you wouldn't, I don't know, you wouldn't study French literature without being able to read French. And so in the same way, you, you wouldn't really want to go on and, or expect to go on and study higher level physics without having that language of physics, which is the maths that we teach at lower levels. Yeah. Um, in our session with um, mathematics and statistics later, mm. we're talking about chaos theory oh, and right. the four color theorem. So again, really interesting takes. Oh, yeah. But yeah. one of the things that students may want to do over the summer is, is some of the maths help 
help mm -hmm. um, sections that they can find at study at the OU. Absolutely, there's there's lots of help out there, lots of information. If if you are so we say nervous about your maths ability, there are lots of resources online for people to go and try and and you know get to grips with before they start, build their confidence before they get into the main modules. Okay, yeah. and. Talk us through, um, again, a little bit about the physics and space things, because mm. you're looking at a various range of things there, from very small things to very mm. large things and very big questions. Absolutely, yeah. So the physics and space uh, module, SM123, it, it tackles those big questions. So we, we start off by looking at the physics of the everyday scale, looking at things like the conservation of energy or forces in, in everyday life, air resistance and things like that. And then we, we focus down on the very small scale to look at atoms and how they behave, nuclei and the cores of atoms, protons and neutrons, and then we get down to the particle physics, the quarks and the Large Hadron Collider. In fact, in, in SM123, we even have an activity where students run their own particle accelerator to see if they can discover the Higgs boson, just like the scientists at CERN did a few years ago. Wow. <laughs> and then we move on to the large scale, like I say, with astronomy and planetary science and, and cosmology too. And um, we have some really nice new material there written by my colleagues, uh, Monica Grady and Ian Wright. Everybody knows Monica, she crops up on the TV all the time. She's written some great material for us about exploring the solar system and focusing on the different space probes that have recently visited different planets and moons of the solar system. It's fantastic stuff. Brilliant. And there's also some computer programming. Lucia was telling us about how we're integrating various different aspects within the curriculum. Absolutely. To, to be a practicing physicist or astronomer or whatever, at some level you need to get to grips with computer programming. So we introduced that in SM123. We have four weeks throughout the, the module um, where people start programming in a language called Python. We assume no knowledge whatsoever. You don't have to install any software. It all runs through the web browser. And um, yeah, it's an introduction to programming to lead you through the physical sciences. Brilliant. Well, we'll be talking about pythons and turtles <laughs> later today, which I'm very much looking forward to. We've, we've got some here, so that's great. OK, now you're going to show us some of these mm. telescopes mm. Um, that students can do. They're the two that we're going to focus on. Yes. This is incredible. I mean, so many people won't know about this. Absolutely. So we have our own robotic telescopes that students can and do use throughout the modules. The first one I'll show, we've got up on the screen here, this is a, a radio telescope, it's called Arrow, and um, my colleague Meredith here is gonna control this for us. This is the interface that students will see in our level two practical science module, SXPA 288. Um, in the top corner there, you see a live webcam of the telescope. This is here on campus in Milton Keynes. Wow. The great thing about radio astronomy, you can do it rain or shine, sun, day or night, it's not affected by the weather. So um, we control the telescope here, and students point the telescope to a different patch of sky. And Meredith, I think you've got it pointing to somewhere on the galactic plane now. Mm. And what we do with this telescope is measure the radio waves coming from the galaxy. Hydrogen gas emits radio waves at a certain wavelength, about 21 centimetres. And as that gas is moving towards us, the radio waves get Doppler shifted to shorter wavelengths. As the hydrogen gas moves away from us, it gets uh, Doppler shifted to longer wavelengths. And so we can measure that. And, and Meredith, if you take a quick scan of this patch of sky that we're looking at, so this is uh, going to be real time now. We're going to build up some data in the bottom uh, part of the screen now, all being well. Uh, there we go. I think it's... Uh well, it may not be working quite live now, but uh, we have some existing data down here. This was some data we took earlier of a scan across this particular patch of the galaxy. And you see a little bump. That's detecting the hydrogen emission at a particular wavelength. We can measure the wavelength of that, work out the Doppler shift, and so figure out how fast that gas in that part of the galaxy is moving. And from that, the students build up a three-dimensional map of the spiral arms of the Milky Way, which is a fantastic project. Wow. Do they have to book into this? I mean, it sounds brilliant. Move dish. I mean, <laughs> gosh, I would think, get, let me get my hands on this. Exactly. <laughs> As part of the module, students will book a particular time slot, and then they'll turn up for their two-hour slot. And during that, they have control of the entire telescope wow. and can take their measurements, then combine their results with those of other students to build up this overall Data I mean, how many it. universities have access to their own telescope yeah, that many, they can let students have a go on for half an hour? And, you know, the, I remember the first time we did this, I, I was 
helping out and we had a group of four students controlling the telescope. One was in Holland, one was in America, one was in Australia and one was in the UK and they were talking together, controlling the telescope, doing a collaborative project. It was fantastic. Wow. And you yeah. must, with, with all of that and with the numbers of students that we have studying STEM with us, you mm. must get quite a, a big range of data that you can collate. Absolutely. I mean, some of our projects, if, if in fact, if we, if we um, look at our other telescope, uh, Meredith, if you go to the... Uh, uh, this is now our optical telescope out on uh, Tenerife. Right. We have two optical telescopes there. Again, this is the student interface that students will see. Um, in the past, we've had students do projects with this telescope and then after their module has finished, go on and publish their results in scientific journals. Wow. So this is now a live webcam inside the dome. It's, it's daytime on Tenerife, so the dome is closed. So we can just see inside the dome there, the telescope. But Meredith, if you, I think if you click on the, uh, the external webcam there, this is a live view on Tenerife now. Uh, these are our two telescopes, the two domes you can see in the foreground. It looks a bit cloudy today on Tenerife, but yeah. normally here on the mountaintop we're above the clouds, so we get perfectly, really good clear skies. And in fact, Meredith, I think if you go to the, uh, the little um, video sequence we have, uh, if we just run this, these are some time-lapse videos uh, that we took um, at the observatory over a few months ago. Uh, now I hear that there's a book coming out that mm. students can engage with some of this activity so maybe if they're thinking about doing a module they could do some free learning to Absolutely. see how they find it. It will launch later this year. Um, it, it's about astronomy with small telescopes and uh, our telescopes out in Tenerife feature in it and students doing that book will be able to use data from these telescopes. And uh, so here's some little time-lapse movies. Wow. The one in the top right, that's over the course of a night. You can see the beautiful clear sky, the Milky Way there moving across as the telescopes move around. Uh, and some images in the bottom there. So of, you can uh, take amazing pictures oh, as well, absolutely. not just look at all the dots. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. It's, wow. it's a fantastic resource, it really is. And indeed, Meredith, if we just go to the last uh, link, we have a website called telescope.org. Now, anyone can go to this. Right. It's a public site. And very soon, anyone will be able to book time on our telescopes. And we've got a wonderful image gallery here. Meredith, I think uh, perhaps you can just show us one or two of the images that were taken with it. Um, Lovely image there. What's that? That could be the Orion Nebula. Looks like it. Looks yeah. like the Orion Nebula in the constellation of Orion, star forming region there. Image taken with one of our telescopes. Do we have time for just another quick yeah. one? That looks like a, a lovely galaxy. So the, the centre of the galaxy is a bit overexposed, but we can see the structure and the spiral outer regions of the galaxy. Um, maybe one more. Have we got? Oh. I don't Beautiful. know what that is, but that's some sort of emission nebula, I would guess. So some glowing gas there. And, uh, yeah, students can take images like that with our telescopes and use the telescopes on projects in both our Level 2 and our Level 3 uh, astronomy and astrophysics modules to do, to do real science. Brilliant. Well, yeah. that is amazing. So check out telescope.org um, if you'd like to, and do make a note to have a look for that book when it comes out in the autumn. Mm. So we're going to do some lab tours now mm. um, and introduce mm. um, our audience to um, some of the research and, and talk about how that influences teaching. Um, so we're going to do a tour of the Cold Atoms Lab, yes. which sounds incredibly exciting. Um, so, Eleni, um, I wonder if you can hear us back out in the Cold Atoms Lab. Let's see what they're oh, doing. Reading you loud and clear. Can you hear us? Yes, perfect. Oh, gosh, where are you? <laughs> we are in the... Eleni, oh, so really, yeah. Eleni, we're yeah, having trouble so hearing fine. you right now, but it sounds amazing what you're doing okay. there. And I wonder, because the sound's not great, if Andrew can maybe show us some of the areas um, and what's actually happening in the lab. Okay, well, I can talk about... So, um... So we can't, the sound's not so great at the minute. So if Andrew's going to talk us through okay. what's happening in the lab. So the, in this okay. cold atoms lab. I'll try and give you some nice images. Yeah, Kaja is a researcher working here in this lab. So in this lab, they're using lasers to cool down atoms to ultra cold temperatures. And when I say ultra cold, this is fractions of a degree above absolute zero. So they're, they're firing laser beams in, in, in perpendicular directions to essentially freeze this little cloud of atoms to stop it moving. And once it's, it's, it's frozen, this stationary cloud of atoms, they can do uh, experiments on that. 
uh, and these are the sorts of experiments that will ultimately lead to something called quantum computing, which, which students you may have heard of. This is really the future of computing, uh, to, to, to um, solve problems in computers vastly quicker than conventional uh, computers as we now have them can do. And the sort of research going on in this lab will ultimately lead to that. So this sort of work, it, it's essentially practical quantum mechanics that's going on here. And it's the sort of thing we talk about in many of our modules. In our, in our level two module, S217, that's physics from classical to quantum, we talk about this sort of uh, quantum mechanical effect and, uh, and how it's used and, and how, how you can study atoms in these, this fundamental way. And then at higher levels, we have a module uh, SM358 called the Quantum World, which explores these applications of quantum mechanics and how things will develop in, in the future to give us uh, these new quantum technologies. Now, I'm sure this isn't a lab that students can book half an hour in. No, this is a, this is a research lab run by my colleague, uh, Sylvia Bergamini, and uh, Kaja is, is a research fellow working here. So there are you know, four or five people in the, in the School of Physical Sciences who work in this lab. But whilst this is a professional research lab, the sorts of things they find out here feed into the, the teaching that we do. And, and Sylvia, as I said, whose lab this is, she, uh, she writes much of our course material on, on quantum mechanics and, and builds that into the, the material which the students will see. Yeah. And it's amazing because Lucia was telling us about some of the things that people can do beyond the curriculum, mm. degree apprenticeships, mm. research, etc. I mean, is the Open University an obvious choice for students who think, actually, I'm going to go and do some quantum mechanics? Well, why not? Um, You've seen some of the uh, open STEM lab resources that we've talked about, the telescopes and so on, but there are other robotic experiments which our students do, which are genuine lab experiments as well. In our uh, level two module that I mentioned earlier, the SXPA 288 practical science module, we have an, a robotic experiment there measuring something called the, the Compton effect. This is where you fire x-rays at a, a, a target and the x-rays scatter off the, the particles, the nuclei, in the, in, the, in the target and they come off at different angles and different energies. And normally, you know, when we used to run summer schools, you'd go into a lab and do that physically. But now our students can control the same experiment robotically over the web, move the equipment yeah. around, take the measurements and do their real experiments from well, wherever they happen to be, their living room. The comfort room. and safety of <laughs> exactly. their own home even exactly as well. Exactly so, yes. Well away from the radiation <laughs> hazard perhaps in the, in the, in the uh, laboratory. So, yeah, particularly with the Open STEM Lab, and I think you've got a session later this afternoon focusing more on that, mm. really our students can do all these practical experiments uh, that perhaps elsewhere you'd, you'd physically go into a lab to do. We, we do still, um, you know... Many of our, particularly uh, stage one modules, will have some simpler home experiments that people can do. For instance, in the, the SM123 module I mentioned earlier, we have an experiment where students measure the distance to the moon. Now, that's just a little experiment you can do in your back garden. So experimental physics, experimental astronomy can happen in all these different ways, I think. Yeah. Brilliant. Our audience are absolutely loving this, and I just want to go um, to the hot desk and see if we've mm. got time for a few questions. Darren, how is everything at home? Um, great, actually. There's quite a lot of chat now. Um, a couple of points to raise. People are saying how useful it was um, to study Y033 um, to prepare for their studies. That's the access module. Mm. But also there are a few comments about people being unsure what telescope to buy as a starter model mm. and, and, and how they could get advice on, on finding that. Well, I could talk about that, certainly. Um, there is a danger in going out spending loads of money and, and, and buying a telescope that's then no use to you. In fact, often the, the best starting point is to buy a really decent pair of binoculars with a nice sturdy tripod to mount them on, and that can be a lot better. But really, if, if you want some advice, um, find one of the many now online or high street shops that are selling telescopes. Perhaps some of the online ones are better because there are then they're, they're run by people that really know what they're talking about. Give them a call and say, you know, this is what I'd like to do, this is my budget, and they won't sell you something you don't need. They'll sell you something that's appropriate for what you need. But nowadays you can buy really nice telescopes, and I see we've, we've got one back here. You can buy really nice telescopes for, you know, not a lot of money, a few hundred pounds perhaps. And, um, you know, these are great for looking at the moon, looking at planets, and just backyard astronomy. It's, it's a fantastic hobby, it really is. 
Brilliant. And who knows where it can lead? Well, yeah, I know exactly. <laughs> <laughs> it leads to my friend not being very awake in the day. <laughs> now, let's take a look um, uh, at where Eleni is at because um, we've also got a molecular physics lab mm. that we'd like to show. So hopefully the sound will be better here. Eleni, how is everything there? Hello, can you hear us? We can, yes. Super. Well, I'm here with Anita, who's going to give us a little tour of this lab here. What is this lab? Um, this is a molecular physics lab. So we use molecular physics in the laboratory to probe the physical and chemical properties of molecules uh, in the condensed space, so molecular solids. So we're looking at ices that are relevant to space environments. So it could be ices in the vast clouds of gas and dust from which stars and planets are formed. Uh, or ices of um, Jupiter's satellites, or maybe Titan's atmosphere. Um, so we use uh, molecular physics as an application to a field of astrochemistry. It's a field that combines observations that astronomers make together with the experiments that we do in the laboratary here to try and understand how molecules are formed in space, how they're then transported and become incorporated into newly forming stars and planets like our own, and make trace the molecular of life Wow, so in this lab we look at the birth of whole solar systems and everything. That's incredible. So I was going to say, could you um, explain what we're seeing here? Yeah, so we, got a, we have a vacuum chamber to simulate the vacuum of space. Um, and then there's a special extreme temperature. So in dense molecular clouds, it's minus 263 degrees. Um, and then we create our ices uh, by spraying gases onto a cold sample molecular spectroscopy technique. So here we have an infrared spectrometer um, uh, where we probe the vibrational states of molecules. Uh, we also transported to Denmark to a synchrotron facility where we can use ultraviolet radiation to probe electronic states. And it all helps us understand how molecules are formed. We can simulate and start off with a handful of inorganic reactants like water, carbon dioxide, uh, methane and so on, and form something really complex, organic, sort of building blocks of life. That is absolutely mind-blowing. This research is so cutting edge. Um, the link to the curriculum then for the students? Well, it, because it's so interdisciplinary, it, it covers uh, curriculum at all levels, but also uh, physics, astronomy, and planetary science as well. I'm on the module team for S111, and I've sort of exploited my experiment here to try and and, and open it up, show it to level one students to look inside to show them how very fundamental this is applied in every research. We took it to Denmark, we had a live link uh, so the students could sort of see what we were doing at the synchrotron. Um, it's also, the work we've done here has also inspired uh, a new experiment that we are um, in the process of creating for 19J presentation of SXPA 288, Practical Physics and Astronomy where students will be able to use an infrared spectrometer, much like this one, to, um, to look at gases and simulate the planetary atmospheres, and measure spectra, and sort of figure out the composition. Uh, and of course, it links to um, astronomy, S282, and planetary science, and astrology, and S283. Uh, and because we are using very fundamental physics, probing electronic states of S283, quantum, quantum world. Um, so, we are, we're doing lots of active research and it all sort of gets tied into the, the teaching across the whole curriculum. That's absolutely fantastic. It's so great to see how the research can be tied directly into the teaching at the Open University. Karen, I hope you got all that. Thank you, Anita, and thank you, Eleni. That was fantastic insight. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much, Anita. Thank you. Thank you. Wow, amazing things here at the Open University. Now, Anita was talking about some of the level two modules, mm, and mm. I wonder if we could just talk about some of the sort of core ones, because you were talking about what might happen at stage one, but I wonder if we might just sort of have a look at some of the options mm. at stage two. So, as I mentioned right at the beginning, the, the pathways through the natural sciences degree, there's a, there's a physics pathway and there's an astronomy and planetary science pathway. On the physics pathway, uh, students would normally do S217, physics from classical to quantum. That's our core physics module, if you like. And it's the content of that that's really what the Institute of Physics say, this is what you should teach to be a physics degree. And so that's what we have in that module. On the other side, we have modules that Anita mentioned, S282 and S283. One is astronomy, the other is called planetary science and the search for life. And they're 
they're the two halves of our astronomy and planetary science curriculum. After that, there is a, a module that, again, we've talked about before, SXPA288, Practical Science. That's where you get to do your hands-on experiments with these robotic telescopes and the robotic lab experiments. And then the final level two module that, that our natural sciences student will take is, is another maths module, MST224, um, Mathematical Methods and modeling. I may not have got the title quite right, but it's something like that. I'm impressed. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that really, that, that's the level two maths that you need in order to go on and do the level three physics and astrophysics. Yeah. Because when we get to those level three modules, uh, with, with the, the sort of, we have modules on electromagnetism, on the quantum world, on astrophysics, on relativity and cosmology, they're really quite mathematical subjects. So you need that foundation of level two maths to study the level three modules. It's an important point because so many students will take STEM subjects mm. as part of an open program. Um, and you, you're talking about the need to scaffold. It's, it's a hierarchical subject, that's the thing. And mm. that is different to perhaps some mm. other subjects. And so, you know, really, if you don't have the foundation, you will struggle at the higher levels. So it, it's really important to be prepared and, and to, to build as you go along. To you know, in the, in the sequence of modules that we offer. Yeah. yeah. Before we look at level three, then, what would you recommend to students? Because it seems that there's a very broad basis to start, particularly with something like S111. Mm. People are getting mm. a go at doing lots of different things. Exactly. And, and often students will start a qualification with an end goal in mind. Mm. I'm going to be doing X, Y, and Z. And very often those will change as they mm. realize that they mm. enjoy doing something more or less mm -hmm. or, or something interests them mm -hmm. more. Mm -hmm. How would you recommend students sort of work through that, bearing in mind this need to be sequential with certain aspects? Well, I think... Starting with S111, as you say, there are pieces in there across all of the sciences, and I mentioned earlier the bits that are maybe the more physical science-y, about waves, about life on Mars, about um, how the sun shines and so on. And if, having done that, you think, oh, well, actually, you know what, I'm, I quite fancy a bit of physics or a bit of astronomy, that's great. Go on to do the SM123 next and the, the foundation maths at level, level one, and then just build it through. If at some stage, you know, you do the level two physics and you think, well, actually, you know what, this isn't for me after all, go in a different direction. Or, as we hope and fully expect, people say, well, you know, this really is for me. And then just follow our recommended pathways through. And, um, you know, we have people that, that go through the whole pathway that really have come in with, with very little prior knowledge at all. And, uh, and we even have quite a lot of people you know, just in recent years, who have finished their physics or astronomy and planetary science degrees with us and then gone on to study PhDs, either here at the OU or elsewhere, and, uh, you know, pursuing very successful professional careers in that field. That's not for everybody, but, you know, a physics degree, a physical sciences degree can open up lots of different areas, really. Uh, it's a, it's a degree that's very in demand because it, it shows uh, numerate skills, it shows problem solving skills um, and you know these are all things that different employers are really keen to have in, in people they take on and, and I think a, a physics degree or a physics based degree really prepares people for a lot of things like that. And with the way that we're allowing students to you know engage with the physical sciences mm. as well by operating telescopes they're getting a huge amount of practical experience that is great for CVs etc exactly. and probably very unique. It is and, and a lot of teamwork as well mm. because you know people perhaps don't appreciate that aspect of it but even though our students are literally all over the world, um, there is teamwork and there is peer review of others' work. Um, for instance, in, in the SM123 module that I'm, I'm just uh, chairing, we've just had an activity where students do an online experiment with a cloud chamber. This is a radioactive detector detecting background radiation. The students write a little presentation, PowerPoint slides, about their experiment, and then they if essentially swap their presentation with another student for constructive feedback and criticism and then reflect on that. And these are all important skills, not just in the sciences, but in all sorts of careers to have that, that experience. Brilliant. Andrew Norton, that's been an amazing session. And thank you, Meredith Morrell, for showing us these uh, telescopes. Um, absolutely brilliant. I've really, really enjoyed that. Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, I hope you've enjoyed that at home. 
there's an amazing event going on this week. So if you're in London, you might want to go down to the Royal Society and check out the show, which is free and is going on all week. And we went down there earlier in the week to find out what was happening. And you'll see that in our next video. And if you think that we can't top that session, uh, showing you the telescopes and the laboratories, uh, then stay tuned because we'll be looking at environment, earth and ecosystems and a tweeting tree. So we'll see you very shortly after this video.